Welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. I'm Yara Hulkenberg, a lecturer at the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture and Pacific Studies. I will take you through this session on Pacific Arts. At the end of the session, you will be able to question the suitability of the concept art in the Pacific, discuss Pacific art as an integral part of Pacific societies, discuss art as an expression of cognitive systems, worldviews, cosmology and the dynamics of Pacific societies. We will ask what is art in the Pacific by discussing the term art and asking what is art in the Pacific. Art as a category alone has little meaning in the analysis of traditional Pacific culture. There is no word for art in Pacific languages. Art is a Western word that comes from a Western perspective with associated aesthetic values. The term art is often associated with evolutionary thinking in the sense that objects designated as art were distanced from their cultural context and evaluated according to Western criteria using Western categories. For example, something is art when it's not functional, but a unique piece that can be exhibited in a museum or hung in a gallery. These Western art criteria are applicable to the contemporary arts that are produced in the Pacific, and we will discuss these later. However, they are not applicable for many other artifacts, such as masks, mats, bark cloth, cloaks or architecture, which are functional. They are made with great skill by experts and have an important role in the societies that produce them. If there is no word for art in Pacific languages, what is art in the Pacific? There are not many works that discuss what we call art from a Pacific point of view. A well-known scholar in Pacific arts, Adrian Kepler, defines arts in the Pacific to encompass all cultural forms that result from creative processes that use or manipulate, handle with skill, words, sounds, movements, materials, spaces, or sense in such a way that they formalize the non-formal. Karen Stevenson, another well-known scholar, writes that the Pacific notion of art is all-inclusive and is an integral aspect of the producing society. Pacific art embodies all that is valued within the society. For example, underlying sets of principles through which Polynesians and many Micronesians interpreted their worlds and organized their society is influenced by ideas of rank based on descent from gods. The arts played an important role in assisting and validating their hierarchical social structure. The objects that were manufactured expressed prestige, power, authority and status and were indicators of the hierarchical order. These are examples of such arts. The Hawaiian feather cape is an indicator of chiefly status and believed to have protective and strengthening qualities. Each chief had a cape and helmet with distinctive motifs. Another example is the fly whisk. Being in the possession of a fly whisk, such as this one from the Austral Islands in French Polynesia, would also indicate one's chiefly status. This one is made of wood, fiber and human hair. The local classification and terminology for these carefully and elaborately produced artifacts is not arts but often heirlooms, such as Maori taonga, that you can see here, or Iyao, Fijian valuables that you can see here. Like descriptions of Western arts, these were certainly intended to elicit aesthetic responses, but not necessarily beauty. They were intended to elicit admiration, fear, awe, to impress and to dazzle the onlooker, such as Kula canoes seen here. These canoes are used in the Trobriand Islands to travel to other islands for the exchange of Kula valuables. The whole Kula exchange is for purposes of enhancing one's social status and prestige. The aesthetics of these canoes are supposed to impress, intimidate and dazzle the onlookers upon arrival. Another example is art related to fighting and war. Shields were not simply for self-defense. They were aggressive instruments and their designs were meant to dazzle, disorient, intimidate and frighten the opponent. Fear could be instilled through the motifs, such as these on asmat shields. The S-shaped motif represents a line along which the belly of a victim could be cut. 
Another is the praying mantis, which is a notorious predator and cannibal. They prey on each other during or after mating. Another example is a study by Silito, who indicates motifs on shields of the wola represent genital organs, which are intended as an insult to the onlooker. An inversion of the order of colors on the shields could also instill fear, as this signifies that the bearer of the shield mourns a relative or friend who has been killed in combat and is determined to seek revenge. So the meaning of the colors and motifs contribute to the efficacy of visual effects on the onlooker. Another example are the ceremonial buildings found in Sipic River societies in Papua New Guinea. Members of each clan deliberately and quite consciously decorate the ceremonial buildings they own in slightly different ways from the others precisely for the purpose of distinguishing themselves as members of a distinct social group. Moreover, the visual qualities of the buildings, the lavishness with which they are decorated with bark paintings and polychrome sculptures, are indexes of the size, political strength and depth of artistic skill of the clans who own them. In many societies, the production and use of or exposure to these artworks are an integral part of the processes that socialize people into ways of seeing believing, understanding the world and who they are. Good examples of this are the arts produced by Aboriginals in Australia. Aboriginal people are incarnations of the spirit beings who traveled over and formed the land we now know as Australia. Some spirit beings stayed in specific places while others met and continued their own way until they turned themselves into a particular site, such as Uluru Rock but also water holes, trees, etc. It is considered a supreme skill if a person is able to use the knowledge they have acquired about their own dreaming to, to produce artworks with ancestral designs and features of the land. These arts are not representations, they are materialized forms of the dreaming. Therefore, according to Howard Morphy, your new paintings on the body, in the sand, on bark or canvas are integral blueprints to the existence of the Yongnu. The same argument can be made for the famous Aboriginal acrylic paintings that can be found in many museums and galleries. This painting shows a permanent waterhole in Sand Hill Country, south of Jupiter Well. The story is that Tingari men, their male initiates and two powerful female initiates gathered at this important sacred site during the dreaming. A fire lit by men from the south to signal their presence threatened the store of sacred ceremonial objects. The initiates were instructed to build a barrier which became a sand hill around the waterhole. This diverted the fire eastwards and the Tingari people followed its burnt out path. This painting is now a materialized form of this particular dreaming. So when an Aboriginal painter describes the features of the landscape depicted in his painting and the story that is associated with it, he is not simply clarifying the painting. He is really telling you who he is. All the art forms that we have discussed are often referred to as traditional art. However, the term traditional implies something static. And as the following example illustrates, these arts and the societies that produce them are far from static. New materials, tools and techniques and styles have constantly been incorporated into these arts and therefore can be examined over time as material expressions of the dynamics of Pacific societies. Here you can see an axe and gun that were traded for goods ships from the West needed on their travels, such as fresh food. These goods were then appropriated and made Solomon by decorating them in a typical Solomon style. Another example is the incorporation of Reckitt's Blue. This is a well-known bleach that is produced in the UK and was introduced in the Pacific by German traders. Because of its bright blue color, it started to be used as paint for various arts. This mask is worn by men in ceremonies to honor the dead and is painted near the eye with Reckitt's blue. Another example is the depiction of Europeans in Pacific arts, such as this European man sitting on a horse 
and again the use of the records blue. When we examine art as a representation of the dynamics of Pacific societies, contemporary Pacific arts are a good example as well, because much of the contemporary art in the Pacific is influenced by the modernist movement in Western art. Modernism, which gathered pace from about 1850, is characterized by constant innovation and a rejection of conservative values, such as the realistic depiction of the world. This has led to experiments with form, production processes and materials. Under the influence of modernism, art could speak for itself and be open to interpretations. The idea became the object. As such, art became part of a cultural commentary and of political discourse, involving a reflexive critique of the artist's own society. Contemporary artists from a wide range of backgrounds have increased their engagement with the international art world and developed their own forms of art by incorporating traditional elements, materials, topics and styles that shape the arts into their final forms. You can see this very well in the contemporary Maori carvings of Cliff Whiting. He transforms traditional themes into new ones. His works depend on knowledge of the traditional Maori aesthetic system. But he does not copy old art forms or processes. He creates new art based on his own background and experiences. Many other contemporary art forms are expressive of the backgrounds and experiences of the artists, such as Martin Morombumbuna. He was an apprentice of his grandfather who has taught him to paint trobriant motifs in a traditional manner. You can see this reflected in his contemporary artworks, such as the painting A Child Who Cries A Lot. Another example is carver Rocky Jensen. He draws on traditional Hawaiian knowledge and forms. He says that he wants to reveal Hawaiian spirituality in his work. He calls this a spirit connection of consciousness and I quote, those who are popularly called gods and goddesses are actually ancestors and what I like to term elementals. My approach to creating art is using my genealogy and the elementals representing fire, water, earth and air. In this way, I do honor to all the things that came before me. The images of my art come from the kupuna, from the ancestors, from the po. I speak for those who cannot speak. I work with the spirit. I have the skill of my ancestors. It is then my kuleana and responsibility to continue their work. They will come in dreams and ask what I am doing with it. And if I am not following the rule, I'd better have a good reason. Use your skill to inspire others, as it is all about connecting. Another example is a famous contemporary artist, John Pule, who was born in Niue and migrated to New Zealand. Influenced by his Pacific Island background, many of his paintings are inspired by Tapa from Niue. Like Tapa from Niue, he uses a structure of frames that are filled with representative motifs. However, unlike the motifs on Tapa from Niue, he fills the frames with figurative images of urban settings in New Zealand. This can be seen in the painting Perturbed Visitor. Like motifs on the Tapa, these images are separated by the frames, but also connected and they tell a story. You only fully understand the artwork when you know the meaning of all the images. There are references to Christianity, often accompanied by sorrow, Polynesian gods, strong and fierce, land, heritage and genealogy, migration, sexuality and language. His art focused on the assertion of an identity as a Polynesian in urban New Zealand. Many contemporary Pacific artworks express the struggles of identity of Pacific Island migrants and their children who have grown up in New Zealand. They are away from their island homes, elders and the knowledge gained when you grow up there. The desire to identify in their new environment but not belong creates inconsistencies and contradictions that translate into metaphor in many artworks. An example is Michael Tuffrey 
who uses the lizard as a metaphor for himself in many of his artworks. The lizard stands for an outsider looking in, listening and observing, learning and acquiring knowledge to be used someday. Many Pacific migrants struggle in their new living environment. They often end up in low-paid jobs and are required to send money to their relatives and church as part of their kinship obligation. This work, entitled The Immigrants, illustrates the struggle of Samoan migrants of remitting money home for church and the education of children. There is a strong contradiction between a Samoan lifestyle and a New Zealand one. Both cultural and economic obligations leave Pacific Island migrants financially drained. A powerful image that illustrates a struggle to mediate the demands placed on Samoan migrants in relation to the fulfillment of obligations at home and making a living overseas. As these artworks all illustrate, many contemporary artworks made by Pacific artists in New Zealand are a reaction to global influences cultural loss and the need to create new directions, assert identity and position themselves. By drawing on their cultural heritage, contemporary Pacific artists have created new contexts for traditional imagery. In conclusion to this lecture, the term Pacific art evokes a wide range and varied range of forms and creative expressions, expanding and challenging conventional definitions of what art can be. Pacific art embodies a diversity of cultural forms of expression and reflects changes and developments. Some art forms ceased to be produced as societies changed and adjusted. Others were maintained and many developed in new ways, reflecting the innovation and resilience of Pacific cultural heritage. Today, many different artistic creative expressions remain a vital part of the lives of Pacific communities, both in the island and in the migrant contexts, such as in New Zealand. The arts provide an important and ongoing point of identification, as well as new points of departure, as artists continue to develop and explore their heritage and identities. Mm.